11 p.m. on November 3rd, election night for the pandemic-disrupted 2020 presidential race. For Kansas political observers, preview what might happen. The interesting thing about this election is we have so many scenarios. No clear winner on election night. It happened during the 2020 Iowa caucuses. No one knew who won for several days. We had the media showing up, uh, you know, opening their, their programs on the night of the Iowa caucus, sitting there and basically waiting for the results, which is, I say, ridiculous because the Iowa caucus is like a four tier process of allocating votes and delegates. And they changed all the rules uh, for the, this year's Iowa caucus. And even if everything went smoothly, it was gonna take quite a while. But you could see when I was clicking around on, in the cable news, they were really upset, the media, uh, all of the you know, different channels, that they did not have these results. And they really started sort of acting like this was a crisis. Like this is a, and this is a really bad look for democracy and everything and gloom and doom. And, and that, you know, so that's not a good look for, you know, when the media from, uh, starts saying just because uh, we don't have the results yet, this is a really bad day for night for democracy. So they, the expectation should be that this is a difficult process when there's so many different types of votes. On the other hand, we have the example of the Kansas primary uh, from this late last summer, where I went into a TV station into election night, all prepared, told my wife, maybe I'll come home at two in the morning. And we sat there and a little before 10 p.m. news even started, we're like, well, I think most of these races are over. And meaning that it wasn't just the counting of the votes, but the actual results were com that were coming in told us there's no way this this candidate's coming back from this. We were able to look at some counties and say, if you know, based on what's going on in these some of these counties, this is going to be a very early night. So we have the gamut. Indeed. While there's a lot of speculation about doomsday scenarios that leave the nation in doubt over who's going to win the presidency, such a result is not a foregone conclusion. I've been covering elections since 1996. Um, the only comparison I have is the 2000 election. And that one, nobody realized ahead of time it was going to be so dragged out. Stay with us. We're about to take you on an exciting and bumpy ride. It, it was just like, whoa, OK. This time, everybody is preparing for it to be dragged out. Now, whether or not it is, I don't know. You know, two years ago, everybody was preparing for the Kansas governor's race to not be finished on election night. And it was done by eight o'clock. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's really hard to tell, but we're all preparing for the worst, preparing for a constitutional crisis, preparing for, you know, a, a Supreme Court battle and preparing for the, the election night to drag out for weeks or months. A lot of these scenarios about challenging the results and litigation um, there may still be litigation, but it would be kind of beside the point um, that it really requires a razor thin election in order for this to come into play. And we may not have one like Bob's example of the Kansas primary this summer. People need to adjust their expectations. Voters, I think, need to understand we probably will not know um, a winner for sure on election night. Um, second, we should be aware that we should not read too much into the ballots that we have counted on election day. What we're seeing is that whereas traditionally in the past there's not a big partisan difference in who requests and votes a mail ballot, this year there is and Democrats are disproportionately requesting mail ballots. Election day voters will probably trend significantly more Republican. So we're not going to have a full electorate in most states counted on election day. There will likely be states that on election night, Donald Trump is winning in the votes that are counted. But as we count mail ballots that, are, that, are, that have come in or will be coming in, um, 
in a state like Kansas, for example, where the mail ballots can come in up to Friday after the election, uh, those are going to trend more Democratic. Mail-in ballots aren't just a factor in the national race for president. Even some state and local races could be decided by them. And that's not unusual. That is not fraudulent or illegitimate, even despite the rhetoric we're hearing now. Uh, there are processes and laws in place for those ballots to be counted. Um, and so the full results may take some time to know. Even with more mail-in voting this year, one thing we shouldn't be worried about is voter fraud. Voter fraud today is extraordinarily rare. Our system is set up to make far more errors of rejecting ballots of people who do have a right to vote than accepting ballots that they shouldn't have accepted. We err on the side of rejecting ballots, not acceptance. But the real issue at this point is now being fought out in the court of public opinion. It might take a little longer to know the winner of this year's election, but eventually we'll have our answer. The biggest problem is whether enough of us are willing to accept the results that don't bring our preferred candidate a victory. There has been interesting polling on this over the years, and I believe that the last presidential election where out in the electorate, people like us, average citizens, the last presidential election where average citizens of both parties agreed that the outcome was fair and legal, it was 1996. Uh, ever since 2000, the party that lost that election, its voters said, the outcome was fraudulent, it was illegitimate. We said right the divide dates back to the dispute over the 2000 presidential election. What Bush v. Gore did was it also ushered in the era of fraud rhetoric. Whether it is casting aspersions on voters or casting aspersions on the people who are counting the votes or, or judges. And I think it set us up as a society and I'm speaking about average people here, not just what our politicians are saying. I think it has set us up as a, as a society to believe that the only way that our side, you know, the good, virtuous, holiness, our side, the only way we can lose is through fraud. But there are things you can do as an individual to not only make the election go smoother, but also strengthen the civic culture. First off, seek good information. For the love of God, don't get your news from social media. Social media is for and was designed for entertainment. Um, we have wonderful professional news outlets that hire professional journalists and teams of fact checkers that validate information before it's reported. For heaven's sake, please don't get your news from social media. Pedraza, who has been reporting on election security over the past year, advises voters to get their questions in early, well before election day. Be mindful of giving yourself time. Uh, last minute always leads to mistakes, and that's on anybody's part. Um, you know, so, the, so if you have questions or concerns, remember election officials are getting busier every day. If you have questions or concerns, they're perfectly willing to answer those questions, but the sooner you can raise them, the better. Because the later you wait, the more harried and harassed they're going to be, the less detailed of an answer you're going to get, and the longer it's going to take you to get an answer. You wait till election day, and you may not get your answer in time simply because they're busy. If you're able to, you can volunteer in your community to be a poll worker, even if you're not old enough to vote. And the little things matter. By ensuring that you are getting your vote counted as intended, you'll be helping not just yourself, but increasing trust in the entire election process. That's important because there's no denying that our country's democracy is at a precarious juncture. It's my job to know how democracies fall apart. And they do. And I see us on that path. And it is not new, it is not Donald Trump. It is a decades long path that the entire political spectrum, the entire ideological spectrum has engaged in. I would be lying to you if I said I was 100% certain that there was not gonna be violence after this election, whether that comes from the left or the right. Like I have a genuine fear as a political scientist that whatever side loses this election, and I'm not saying we're gonna have like, what happened in Kenya after an election a few years ago where thousands of people died. No, I'm not, I, I, I really don't think that's gonna happen. But 
more isolated acts of terrorism, of violence, in whatever way that they, they occur. I have never thought as a political scientist that this is something I'm afraid of. And, and I genuinely am. But it's not something that we have to let happen. We can do something about it as individuals and as Kansans. I think one thought I would have is, you know, for average citizens of any age, it's that, you know, democracy is supposed to make you uncomfortable. It is supposed to challenge you. And that really runs counter to how probably most of us function politically, where we have relatively few people that we engage with politically, and they're people who already agree with us. And we end up, we, we create our own echo chambers in our social lives. Um, to the point where we believe that it's impossible that a majority of society might disagree with us in any way whatsoever. I think that's unhealthy. And I think average citizens have a lot more power than you realize to change that process if you care to change it. Some of us are perfectly happy to live in a bubble and think that that bubble is best, um, especially if it suits our political goals. But you know, you have the power to engage with people who might not always agree with you. You have the power, if, if you want people to vote their ballots correctly, if you want people to think differently about democracy, you have the power to have those conversations in your own social networks. You know, and those are conversations that we are, we are often afraid to have. You know, we, we, we lump politics with religion and sex and money as these taboo topics. And they can be conflictual, but I think that also feeds, feeds that bubble. So I would say you don't have to necessarily depend on Donald Trump or Laura Kelly or Joe Biden or anyone else to change politics for you. You have the power to start to change that yourself if you care to change it.